Commodities are one of the few consistent bright spots in 2023, with gold and silver setting multi-year highs and electrification driving base and battery metals prices, many investors are looking to put more of their money to work in commodities. Well, if you're in commodities, you're in luck. We have with us today one of the best minds in the commodities space, legendary speculator and investor Rick Rule. Rick is, of course, the founder and former CEO of Sprott Holdings and the founder of Rule Investment Media. Rick, so great to have you with us today. Ernest, thank you for having me back. I've enjoyed my conversations with the Kitco audience now for decades. And they've enjoyed it too, as I am sure you know uh, from the comments and from the, uh, from the attention. So uh, let's get, we've got a lot of ground to cover with you today. Uh, we've got a lot going on in commodities and we're gonna be touching on the banking crisis as well. But uh, let's get started with precious metals. Uh, we've seen gold break through 2000. Um, we've, seen, we've seen a lot of support for gold. Uh, we've seen a lot of central bank buying. We've seen some uh, some Wall Street interest. We've seen some ETFs beginning to to jump into gold in a significant way. Uh, do you think that this uh, this current push uh, for gold is sustainable? I think it is sustainable in the intermediate term. If they succeed in taking they meaning the big thinkers, the governments succeed in taking nominal interest rates higher. Uh, the progress of gold will be slower. But I think now uh, that gold really is on the path. It's it's worthy for your audience to note that this $2,000 gold price, while a record in nominal terms, uh, is not a record in real terms in the sense that it's measured uh, against dollars, which have themselves deteriorated. So it, it's useful to understand that. Uh, it's useful to understand a couple of other things too. Historically, what's always driven the gold pr price more than anything else is people's concern about the maintenance of their purchasing power in more conventional savings instruments. And there is nothing that should worry savers more than interest rates, which are insufficient to keep pace with inflation. The best illustration of this I know is the U.S. 10-year Treasury, which will pay you 3.4% interest every year for 10 years in U.S. dollars in a currency which the U.S. Congressional Budget Office says is losing 7% of its purchasing power a year. In other words, the arithmetic is that the U.S. government guarantees to reduce your purchasing power by 3.5% a year, compounded for 10 years. The first promise made by the government that I'm prepared to believe that they will keep in my lifetime. This is referred to by Jim Grant as return-free risk. What gold really needs to beat and has been beating this year is return-free risk. It's important, too, to consider how far gold can go. The market share of precious metals and precious metals-related securities in the United States, the market I know best, is less than one half of 1%, which is to say precious metals-related investments comprise less than one half of 1% of all savings and investment asset classes in the United States. The four-decade mean market share is 2%. I believe that negative real interest rates, quantitative easing, debt and deficits combined will at least propel gold's market share to the four-decade mean. If that's correct, demand for precious metals-related assets will increase fourfold, which is precisely what I think is going to happen. Well, that's, uh, that's definitely music to the ears of gold investors. And uh, if, if we have the historical data to go by, then I guess there's a, there's a, a real reason to be expecting that. Uh, now, uh, junior gold equities are also surprisingly below where you might think they would be. Uh, by historical measures, uh, juniors ought to be higher than they are at this point in the cycle. Uh, what do you think is holding juniors back right now? I think we need to consider three things there. Uh, the first is that traditionally gold bull markets are led by the big companies. And we've seen that happen this time. The move into gold, particularly from generalist investors, has concentrated among the equities and large cap names, which has almost always happened. So the lag in the small cap names relative to the large cap names can be expected. We're just now starting to see a mergers and acquisition cycle, which is usually what kicks off the juniors. It's important to know that this gold bull market is unlike some others in the sense that it's occurring, it's occurring consistently with a lagging market in equities generally, small cap equities generally. So the marginal equities, and there's nothing in the world more marginal 
than a non-revenue producing gold junior uh, have suffered disproportionately. I think it's important too to uh, understand that investors need to be much more discriminating among their juniors. There are probably 2,000 mining juniors in the world, and I would suspect that not more than 300 of them are viable. Uh, so it, it's very important that investors use information services like Kitco to segregate among the good, the bad, and the ugly in the mining juniors. Make no mistake, if gold continues higher and the majors continue higher, the juniors will get pulled along. It's happened four times before in my career. This follows a predictable pattern. The timing is uncertain, but uh, my suspicion is that the outcome uh, is inevitable, even if it isn't imminent. All right. So it's not imminent. It's hard to predict. But I've got to ask you, when do you think we, we could be seeing a move for the juniors? What do you think could be the catalyst? Maybe we don't know exactly when that catalyst happens, but what could it be? I think there's two catalysts. The first is M&A. Uh, you know, the, the, the recent takeover, uh, as an example of Sabina by B2. Good for the acquirer, good for the shareholders of the acquired company. Uh, there is nothing like M&A to add both liquidity and hope to the sector with everybody looking for the next name. The other thing is that the money that the juniors were able to raise 10 years ago and begin to focus on exploration is beginning to bear results. We all expect that when money is raised, we get exploration results in six months or eight months or 10 months. That's not the way it works. It takes a decade of focused exploration on new terrain to begin to yield discoveries. And we're starting to see the beginnings of a discovery cycle, the West African discovery uh, in Burkina Faso, the predictive discoveries discovery, the discovery of Chalice in Australia, uh, the wonderful new discovery of Canadian listed reunion gold uh, down in Guyana, we're beginning to see a renaissance, not merely in exploration expenditure, but rather in discovery success. So my suspicion is that the discovery success that we're just starting to see stirred into the pot uh, with M&A uh, will be what ignites the junior cycle. All right. Now, uh, let's, uh, let's turn to energy. We've uh, seen natural gas prices crater. Uh, they're down over 50% in 2023, currently around $2.19. Uh, do you see any signs of a recovery on the horizon for natural gas? Yeah, absolutely. Natural gas is too cheap. Uh, and I think we need to segregate North American natural gas markets into U.S. markets, which are merely cheap, and Canadian markets, which are felony cheap. Uh, sometimes the ACO price uh, is almost sub-zero, which is to say the gas producers don't get, get, get paid enough money uh, to ship it into markets that'll buy it. Uh, this is a, a, a political conundrum in Canada. It's not an economic conundrum in Canada. And I think that sanity is on the horizon. I think that natural gas as a whole is a wonderful speculation. The arbitrage or two arbitrages, one between the BTU price of natural gas and the BTU price of oil, is at almost historic highs. Gas is cheap, the utility of gas is great, and gas transports well. I don't believe that the gap in the, the, gap in the arbitrage will be settled by lower oil, lower oil prices either, uh, because sustaining capital investment by oil companies is lagging, which means that oil will continue to be scarce and high priced. I think that the gap in BTU pricing will be settled by North American gas uh, recovering in price. It's worthy to note that the surplus supplies uh, of gas in the United States, for the most part, are occurring as a byproduct of drilling for uh, oil. Uh, in other words, we're getting byproduct gas production, particularly in the Permian, uh, which is exceeding our storage capacity in the United States. And that goes to a second arbitrage, which is the arbitrage between natural gas pricing in North America, the United States and Canada, and liquefied natural gas prices in the Far East, uh, and in Europe, the uh, arbitrage on a million BTU basis uh, is that gas sells in this market for about $2, two US dollars per million BTU, while that same gas sells for $8 per million BTU in the seaboard market. We are, as a consequence of low natural gas prices, building LNG facilities like MAD, but we're also building chemical plants. We're building fertilizer plants. We're building peaking power plants. Uh, in other words, this, this low price is stimulating the creation of infrastructure that will itself uh, create new demand. 
one of the things that I've been able to note for Kitco audiences for decades is that the cure for low prices, Ernest, are low prices. These low natural gas prices will at once curtail supply while they increase demand. Increasing demand, reduced supply is a recipe for higher prices. Speculating in North American natural gas, including Canadian natural gas, uh, is, I think, something that's very topical right now. All right, and, and are you expecting to see a move in natural gas prices in the short term? I know we're entering the uh, we're entering summer, so uh, demand would uh, would often be down. But are you are you expecting to see some of this uh, some of what you're describing kick in and support prices in the near term? I think we'll have a bifurcated market. Uh, I think the U.S. market uh, for natural gas will bounce. I think the Canadian market will continue to be constrained uh, because of uh, Ottawa's policies and the inability to create infrastructure to move gas out of the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. This is not an economic conundrum. This is a political conundrum. All right. And uh, and what about uh, battery metals and electrification? Uh, obviously, the demand is expected to grow dramatically over the coming years. Uh, but we also saw a major announcement from Chile that they're looking to effectively nationalize lithium in the country. I mean, they would be, they would need 50.1 percent uh, control of any of any uh, lithium mines, and they have a, a bunch of uh, pretty lofty targets for what they want to do with that control, with that money. Uh, could this be the start of a trend for uh, lithium producers as we enter this this era of of massive investment in electrification? I think it's part of a broad trend in commodities. Whenever commodity prices rebound, uh, governments whose business is greed uh, look at the sector with the view to nationalization. And nationalization never worked. If you look at what Petro-Canada did for energy bills in Canada or the damage it did to Canadian taxpayers, if you look at the extraordinary lack of success that Chile itself had with Codelco, the world's most inefficient copper company, if you look at the value that was destroyed by the Congolese and the Zambians, nationalizing their oil industry, or the wonderful accomplishment made by PDVSA, uh, crippling <laughs> the oil economy in Venezuela, uh, you come to understand something about the efficiency with regards to countries' ability to manage their natural resources. It does not make sense for Chile to put the post office in charge of the lithium business. Now, this is very good news for lithium producers outside of Chile. If you take the world's most efficient lithium producer, and you put the productive infrastructure in the hands of bureaucrats who can't deliver mail or educate kids, it's an absolute recipe for industry failure, which I think should be viewed ironically with some failure, with some uh, um, uh, hope uh, among uh, lithium producers in places like Canada and Australia. This occurs uh, in what I think is probably an understated uh, market for battery and electric metals. Uh, I say understated because although the sector has favor relative to other classes of resource stocks, many people, I think, don't grab the importance of increasing energy density around the world, but particularly in frontier and emerging markets. People in Canada and the United States, which is to say rich people, think the story is about electric vehicles. And that's certainly part of the story. But many people don't realize that a billion people on Earth have no access to primary electricity. Two billion people on Earth have access to intermittent and unaffordable electricity. And the real story here is the inclusion of 35% of humankind uh, in an energy-dense, materially intense life. We've done a great job over the last 40 years of raising the material living standards of the, of the poorest of the poor. I think that we're going to finish the job. There's still going to be a lot of poor people, but they're not going to be desperately poor 20 years from now. And that's going to require massive, massive amounts of copper, of nickel, of cobalt, of lithium, of, vin of vanadium, of tin. Uh, massive, massive, massive amounts. And massive amounts that will be produced by an industry that has been hampered by three decades of underinvestment in exploration and production. We are going to experience, uh, absent a worldwide depression or recession, we're going to experience shortages of supply uh, in things like copper in particular, almost irrespective of what we do. And layering on the demand that comes from the electrification 
particularly the electrification of the poorest of the poor around the world, uh, I, I think is going to generate tremendous opportunities across a broad range of these energy transition materials. Right. This is interesting because so much of the of the numbers we see that are that are trying to project demand for uh, battery metals and electrification, including silver, uh, uh, an enormous amount of those numbers are based on the idea of commitments made by states like California, countries like the United right. States, Europe. Uh, these are these are easier to project. We have government commitments. We know they have the money. Uh, the, in some cases, it's environmental standards that are going to be pushing this, and those standards aren't aren't likely to be rolled back, especially in Europe, probably California. So. Uh, this, what you're describing of, uh, I guess what you're talking about is the electrification of the developing world in places where it might not be efficient to build hydroelectric dam, to build uh, other kinds of power plants and move the electricity. Uh, it would be more efficient to have things like solar and, and to have more local production in countries where you have tons of sun. And uh, and and it's a much more realistic investment. So you're you're saying that this is actually going to be one of the major drivers for for battery metals going forward. You make several interesting points that I think we should unpack. The overall answer is yes. Uh, just as many of your listeners will have come of age as natural resource investors in the decade 2000 to 2010, and and that boom was really spawned by the urbanization of China. Uh, this process is repeating itself around the world uh, to the best interest of all concerned. Uh, the second point you made uh, uh, revolves really around generation sources. And I would suspect that we're going to need all forms of power. Solar, absolutely. Wind, to be sure. But the truth is, the largest year on record for coal demand was 2022. Uh, <laughs> in fact, we have now spent almost $5 trillion over 40 years in alternative energies, and we have reduced the market share of uh, conventional fossil fuels from 82% all the way down to 81%. When people ask me about energy sources, the answer is yes, we're going to need more of everything. And in particular, we're going to need the ability to get energy irrespective of how it's generated from where it's generated to where it's used. And we're going to have to store it increasingly. Distributed storage is a very fancy word for batteries. <laughs> we're going to need better transmission. We're going to need better generation. We're going to need better storage. And we're going to need more efficient utilization. And all of those things, all of those things require these energy transition materials. All right. Well, that's uh, then. I guess the projections we're seeing uh, are only scratching the surface of the potential for for battery metals like lithium. Can you give us a, a a price prediction on lithium? What are you seeing lithium doing in the near term, or between now and the end of the year? I see the process for ele the prices for elemental lithium, uh, which is to say unprocessed lithium, continuing to fall. The world doesn't have a shortage of lithium. We have a shortage of lithium processing capacity. We will run into supply constraints, <laughs> depending on the efficiency with which the Chilean government manages to steal their lithium industry. Uh, to the extent that the government is successful and they transfer control of the lithium industry to their post office, uh, obviously you will begin to see uh, production inefficiencies in the largest lithium producer in the world. In the near term, the opportunity in lithium isn't lithium production, but rather lithium processing, the ability to turn uh, lithium into the lithium chemicals that are required for battery and other utilization worldwide. With regards to raw lithium, my projection for the rest of the year is lower prices. All right. Now, an another important part of this uh, evolving energy picture is nuclear energy. And we've seen uh, uranium prices up. Uh, we saw uranium break above 53.40 at the beginning of the month, and it's tested that uh, range, that key resistance level, a few times over the last year. Bank of America said yesterday that we're in a uranium bull market. Uh, so do you think that this move that we're seeing in uranium is sustainable as well? I do. Uranium is probably my favorite commodity in terms of the certainty uh, I have uh, around the near and intermediate term 
uh, prospects. The spot quote that you see now is about $54 a pound. But the truth is that the real market quote is higher because an increasing amount of demand is coming in the term market. Uh, and these terms are opaque, but traditionally they're priced at a, at a fairly substantial premium to spot. So although you see the quote for the spot market, the real market for uranium is transacting at higher prices, but not high enough for the industry. Um, it is suggested by the International Energy Agency that the fully loaded cost to produce a pound of uranium worldwide, by fully loaded, I don't just mean mine costs, I mean after tax uh, and after the cost of capital, is 60 US dollars a pound for existing production. And the incentive price for new production is $75 a pound. We have a substantial production shortfall, which means that you need to take into account the incentive price. So my suspicion is that the market reference price moves from $54 or $55 to $75 a pound over the three to four year time frame. Maybe being front loaded. I say maybe being front loaded because two things have changed. One, my former employer, Sprott, with the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, has now taken 55 million pounds of supply out of inventory uh, and sent that uranium in effect to uranium heaven, uh, which tightened up the spot market. The second thing is that the uranium oversupply was really a function of um, the tragedy at Fukushima uh, and the fact that uh, Jap Japan's nuclear fleet went on ice. The Japanese now are restarting that nuclear fleet uh, and nuclear power enjoys uh, the good fortune of being favored by over 63% of the electorate in Japan, which means that the chief source of uh, weakness in the uranium price is becoming the chief strength of uranium price as a consequence of Japanese restarts. We're seeing, too, increasing public favor for uranium uh, and nuclear power really around the world, typified as an example by the co-founder of Greenpeace, saying the only hope for uh, carbon neutral mankind uh, is ironically uh, nuclear power. So I think we're, we're in a real resurgence and a real renaissance. And I think the Bank of America is right. The question now isn't when the uranium bull market will begin. It's already begun. All right. Yeah, that's it's an interesting uh, an interesting change in rhetoric that we've seen. It kind of uh, reminds me of the quote by uh, Winston Churchill that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other forms. And uranium uh, nuclear power is the worst, worst, most dangerous, most destructive form of power except for every single other form of power generation. So I, I think uh, when 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 we see these types of statements coming from uh, the environmental side, we uh, I guess there's. Uh, some of the last bulwarks of resistance to uh, nuclear power growth and uh, and by extension uranium demand are 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 dissolving. I think that's accurate. I think it's a wonderful analogy, frankly. Thank you. So when do you think? Uh, so you're, you're seeing seventy five dollars being what ought to be the reference price in the market. Uh, if you're seeing cost uh, closer to $60, when do you see uranium breaking above 60, which is to say, by your analysis, breaking even? It, it, could that be something uh, I, we I see think, this year? I think you'll see the real uranium market, which is not to say the spot market, but the blend of the term market and the spot market above $60 this year. I All think right. that you'll see the median price received by producers above $60 this calendar year, assuming that the spot market uh, accounts for perhaps 20 to 25 percent of transactions in 2023, and the term market accounts for 75 or 80 percent of transactions. I think you'll see a real uranium price above sixty dollars in 2023. All right. Well, uh, I'd like to change tracks for a little bit because I'd really like to get your views on the banking crisis as well. So we were putting banking crisis in quotes for a little while, but we're still seeing failures uh, and the fundamental problems haven't changed. Interest rates are high. They'll stay high for a while. Even, even the most optimistic uh, expectations for the Fed, uh, assuming they've stabilized, they're not going to start dropping precipitously. So uh, what are you hearing uh, from the banking industry? Uh, what do you think are the risks of a broader contagion? You may know banking is near and dear to my heart. I've been part of starting six banks in the course of my life. And I'm in the process now of starting a seventh battle bank. Uh, so I, I'm I, I'm attracted to the banking business. First of all, it's a very good business, but it's a business that's really about blocking and tackling. Uh, I am going to argue 
that the last 40 years, which is to say 1982 to 2002, were probably the most benign economic climate in the history of mankind. <laughs> uh, declining real interest rates, uh, a great demographic boom, a, glo uh, a, a, a massive inclusion around the world, uh, great trade. And I think the benign economic cl climate that we've faced for the last 40 years is over, which means that banking has to change. What happened to the banks that failed is despite the fact that several of them, including First Republic and Silicon Valley Bank, had very good basic franchises. They served their borrowers in particular well. They forgot the part of banking that goes around blocking and tackling. The idea, as an example, that you would fund long-term five or six-year investments with overnight money is the same liquidity mistake that brought down the United States savings and loan industry <laughs> in the later part of the 80s and the early part of the 90s. We've seen this before. The idea that you uh, have five or six-year duration assets that you're funding with overnight liabilities uh, is difficult in two senses. If the interest rate rises, the interest rate that you're receiving on your assets isn't increasing, but the interest rate that you have to pay in your liabilities does increase. So your lending margin goes away. The second thing that happens is uh, the capitalized value of the distributions, which is to say the price of these longer term bonds falls with rising interest rates. So your costs go up, but your assets go down. And the mark to market losses that were experienced by First Republic Bank and by Silicon Valley Bank are really the things that caused a run on their deposits. But there's a, a second form of arithmetic that bankers need to pay attention to. And by the way, the Canadian banks, uh, I'm embarrassed as an American to say, do a good job of this. The uh, maintenance of sufficient cash and near cash reserves uh, relative to the level of overnight or now deposit liabilities. Traditionally, banks have needed about 25% uh, of the amount of their now deposits available as cash or near cash. Uh, and because cash or near cash uh, assets don't yield as much as longer term cash, prudent banking imposed some costs on profitability. I would argue with you that four decades of relatively benign economic climate uh, encouraged risk-taking uh, with regards to liquidity at banks throughout North America, with the Canadian banks being uh, notable exceptions. I think that one of the things that we need to worry about now is really consumer behavior. Uh, so many consumers have changed their deposits from regional and community banks in the United States to the big banks that they have encouraged the big banks to lower the interest rate that they pay. Uh, depositors are, in effect, recapitalizing the bank by foregoing interest. Uh, most of the big banks in the United States and all of the big banks in Canada will, if they can, get away with not paying you any interest on your checking account. This is insane. This is really, truly insane. Uh, investors need to wake up and, and need to understand that the purchasing power of their deposits is declining at 7% compounded. The idea that you give somebody else the use of your money for no interest uh, consigns you to a personal bank failure. <laughs> it's something that all of the Kitco uh, listeners need to pay real attention to. Yeah, and I guess it's a it's a strong case to be made for commodities, where they are going to be uh, outperforming inflation and actually making real gains, uh, even taking inflation into account. So, what do you think uh, the Fed ought to be doing to address the banking crisis that they aren't doing already? Obviously, we can't control consumer behavior, although we can influence. Uh, by we, I mean the government. What should the Fed be doing? Uh, that they are not already doing for the for this banking crisis to be arrested or at least uh, not to get much much worse what they should do and what they'll never do is get out of the way interest rates should be set by the market <laughs> the idea that it is the business of the fed to manipulate interest rates uh is bad policy but good politics listen artificially low interest rates really constitute a war on savers by spenders. In a democracy, spenders are more numerous than savers. So artificially low interest rates, which is to say 
uh, policies that penalize savers on spenders, pardon me, on behalf of penalize savers on behalf of spenders are always going to be uh, popular. But societies never get rich by spending. <laughs> they get rich by saving. What should the Fed do? The Fed should get out of the way. What will they do? More of the same. Uh, unfortunately, when I look at the Fed in the United States uh, and I look at the employees of the regulator in various regional centers, I see very highly qualified, very intelligent, very motivated people. At the top of the agency, I see a political agenda, a political agenda that in my country comes out of Congress and your country comes out of Parliament. Uh, which means that the politicization of interest rates is in itself the problem. My suspicion is that the period of higher interest rates that we have seen uh, will lead to market disruption as it had and will eventually lead to economic disruption. When that happens, I suspect that the noise that you will hear from the political class uh, will cause uh, central bank officials in both countries to either moderate the increase in interest rates or lower interest rates. And if that happens, if the amount of interest received by depositors uh, continues to decrease relative to the value of the spending power of their currencies, I, I think one of the outcomes that you will see will be increasing disintermediation from savings products into gold, uh, 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 a response mechanism that's been tried and succeeded for 2,000 years. All right. So that uh, that half of 1% uh, has a lot of things pushing it closer to the historical 2% that you mentioned. I would argue that that's the truth. All right. Now, uh, you've also got the Rule Symposium on Natural Resource Investing coming up in July. I guess with the way commodities are performing these days, you must be seeing a lot of interest. Uh, can you give us a sense of what this year's edition will be focusing on? Well, one improvement this year is that uh, we have a new media sponsor called Kitco, uh, which I'm very pleased to welcome to the symposiums after 20 years of the symposium. As you suggest, this symposium has gone on around natural resources for a long time. We don't try to be all things to all people. We talk about precious metals and natural resources. If you're interested in technology stocks, if you're interested in pot stocks, please don't come. Uh, if you are interested in natural resources and precious metals, please do come. We offer many things. We offer great paradigm. Uh, you will hear from Bill Bonner, founder of Agora, which talks to 12 million people. You'll hear Jim Rickards. You'll hear Grant Williams. You'll hear Nomi Prinz from the Fed itself. You will hear paradigm. You will hear the world described as it is, not the way the world is described on the CBC or the BBC or NBC. Assuming that that worldview strikes you as being something intelligent, you will hear some of the greatest portfolio managers in the natural resources business people like my great friend Adrian Day or independent analysts like Joe Mazumdar or Brent Cook talk about how you can affect investing strategies in natural resources with your own money. Importantly, too, you will hear from the living legends. The living legends are people like Sean Rosen, Rob Fr Robert Friedland, Rob McEwen, Bob Quartermain, uh, people who have built multi-billion dollar natural resource companies from scratch. You will hear the techniques that they use to build these companies in all markets and what lessons that they learned that make them and can make you better investors. This year, the conference will be held at the wonderful Boca Resort in downtown Boca Raton, half a mile of Atlantic Ocean waterfront, 245 acres in downtown Boca Raton. If you went to book a room there right now, they charge you $1,100 a night for that room. We're going to be able to turn this room to you because we buy a lot of them for $300 a night. If you can't come to Boca Raton, if it's inconvenient for you, if you're busy that time, we're going to live stream this event, which means that you can watch it from your own home, even if your own home is in Germany uh, or Singapore. Importantly, too, uh, as with every investment product offered up by Rural Investment Media, if you don't think you got your money's worth, email me. I'll give you your money back. A full money back guarantee. 
if you attend this course either in person or live stream, and by the way, either way, you'll have access to all the material online for six months after the conference is over. If you don't think that you got your money's worth, no problem. I'll give you your money back. No questions asked. I believe there's going to be a link uh, uh, associated with this video uh, for people who want to access uh, the conference. Uh, otherwise, the web address is Rule Symposium. I'd like, too, to refresh an offer I've made to Kitco listeners for years, which is to say, if you like uh, my natural resource discussions, I'm happy to personalize them for free. <laughs> If you go to ruleinvestmentmedia.com and list your natural resource stocks, I personally will rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. Uh, no obligation, no charge. I'll also comment on stocks where I think my issue, my uh, comments might have value. That's ruleinvestmentmedia.com. And by the way, uh, if you are interested in better banking, if you're interested in getting paid money on your bank deposits or... If you want to borrow money against those physical precious metals that Kitco has so graciously sold you, uh, in the question and comment section uh, on the rankings database at Rural Investment Media, simply write bank, and I'll send you information on borrowing against your precious metals holdings uh, or maintaining savings and checking accounts with one bank that actually has the good graces to pay you interest. Well, that uh, in this day and age, that's uh, that's quite the pitch, with uh, with everyone getting everyone essentially lending to lose uh, for yep. guaranteed losses. That's uh, that, that's great to hear. Well, thank you so much, Rick. Uh, it's always great to get your insights. Uh, Ernest, a real pleasure. I look forward to having these conversations again. As do we. You're watching Kitco News. I'm Ernest Hoffman. Keep it here for more coverage of critical markets, and don't forget to subscribe.